So thanks, Martin. Thanks to Nastya and um, Stefano for the invitation and for putting up this meeting. It's always a great pleasure to be here at AZ. And today I want to talk about a recent joint work with a former postdoc of mine, Leonard Kreutz. And I see this talk a little bit on the defect side of the conference, but on an optimistic uh, way, because I want to avoid defects and I want to exclude defects, which should lead to crystalline structures. And that brings me to the to the title of my talk, crystallization. So um, that's the observation that at low temperatures, um, particle systems tend to arrange in periodic structures. And uh, mathematically, you can attack that by means of molecular mechanics. So you consider um, your particle system as a um, atomistic configuration, so points in space, which interact uh, with each other with interaction potentials. And the simple choice could be as on my slide, so you have pair interactions between two pairs, uh, two, between pairs of points um, governed here by Leonard Jones interactions. Of course, you can take anything more complicated that you want. You can take free body interactions, multi body interactions, but uh, whatever you take, the crystallization problem is always the same. It's the question whether ground states of this energy, so global minimizers, are subsets of a, of a lattice or not. And if you think of um, Leonard Jones' potentials in 2D, the conjecture is that the triangle lattice should be optimal. And this has been proved for a variant of the Leonard Jones potential by Florian Tile in the so-called thermodynamic limit, where the number of particles n tends to infinity. Today, instead, I'm interested in the case of finite crystallization. That means that the number of particles n stays finite. And this is a, a different problem because then you see, okay, you have a finite configuration, you have a boundary, and this boundary will, will lead to boundary effects. And indeed, not much is known in the, in the case of finite crystallization for the Leonard Jones potential. And actually, you shouldn't hope for too much because already in 1D, um, one has shown that for such a chain of atoms, actually in the finite case, you cannot expect crystallization in the sense that all the bond lengths between neighboring bonds have the same length. And the reason for this is surface effects coming from the left boundary and the right boundary. Only in the case where you just have nearest neighbor interactions, which corresponds to the fact that you take a short range potential, then you can expect crystallization to hold in the sense that all the bonds between neighboring atoms have the same length. And when it comes to the two-dimensional case, uh, you even need to go to more restrictive assumptions, more restrictive potentials. And Heidmann and Radin in the 80s, they showed that you get crystallization in the triangular lattice for the so-called sticky disk potential. So what is the sticky disk potential? If you want, it's a brittle limit of the Leonard Jones potential if you take the exponent p and you send it to infinity. Um, this means that you take the well and you make it narrow, narrow, and, and even more narrow, so such that in the limit it um, breaks down to the sticky potential where uh, distances which are less than one between two atoms are forbidden, gives you infinite energy. Then there is a normalized distance. In my model, it's normalized to one, where you have actually interaction between the two particles, and the interaction is normalized to minus one. And whenever the distance is bigger than one, there is no interaction at all. So you see that now the crystallization problem boils down to a purely geometric problem. It's uh, equivalent to take a number of um, spheres in the plane and to maximize the number of tangencies between these, these spheres. And um, they are sometimes also called hard spheres because they are not allowed to overlap. This comes from uh, the part on the left here of the potential where it's infinite if the distance is less than one. It's very important to mention that um, this is not a problem in elasticity. It's a very brittle uh, setup because whenever the bond between two neighboring particles is not exactly one, the bond is broken and there is no interaction at all. Um, you can generalize that a little bit uh, to what Radin calls um, the soft potential. So here you see I replace the sticky potential by something which has a linear growth here out of the minimum. And in this setting, you can still prove the same crystallization result in the um, triangular lattice. But again, it's no elasticity because elasticity would require you to have um, something of Leonard Jones type. So you have a quadratic growth around the minimum. Now, you can ask yourself, can you have different structures, other structures in the 2D case, which are less packed, less packed as the triangle lattice? Yes, you can. And uh, this goes back to Ulisse and his collaborator, Eduardo Mainini. Um, 
And uh, the point is that they add free body potentials to the, to, the, um, to the energy. Here you see two bonds, and these bonds form an angle. And this angle now contributes to the energy in terms of a tertiary potential. And you see here this tertiary potential is minimized for an angle 2 pi over 3. This is the angle in the regular hexagonal lattice, you so you can expect the hexagonal lattice to be optimal. Um, interestingly, they don't need to assume um, this linear slope condition on the previous slide, so you can t really take a quadratic row for the pair potential, but now for the angular potential, you need to kind of take care of this. Now you cannot really see it on the slide, but here this is not a quadratic row, but I need a kink here at the minimum, and I will tell you later why I need this. Okay. Um, then you can think of what else could you do in the two-dimensional case. Of course, you can also take the square lattice, and you can get that by taking a slightly different setup. This is now due to Manini, Piovano, and Stefanelli. And you see here the difference is that I just changed the minimizers of the tertiary potential here. It's minimized at multiples of pi over 2, and then you can expect the, the square lattice to be optimal. Now, these crystallization results, basically, they all follow the same kind of strategy how to prove them, and it's done by an induction method. The idea is you see your configuration as a, as a planar graph, uh, where the atoms are your, vert are your vertices and the bonds are your edges. And then you, s you decompose this graph into two pieces, into a boundary and into an interior. Uh, for the boundary, you, you do some kind of fancy boundary energy estimates, and I will tell you later what this is. And for the interior, you, you use an induction method. Namely, you know for the smaller configuration in the, inter in the interior, it has less atoms, so you can use already an induction hypothesis on that, namely that minimizers are already a subset of a lattice. And then you glue these two things together. So basically, all proofs go like this, and um, our idea with Leonard was that we wanted to have a different proof, which is somewhat a little bit more flexible, because it doesn't use this um, technique, it doesn't use boundary energy estimates, and it does not use an induction method. Um, and uh, the first case where we did this is the square lattice, so um, in my talk today I will exclusively focus on the square lattice, and the outline of my talk will be as follows. So uh, first of all, I will tell you, tell you a little bit more about the square lattice. In particular, I want to tell you what's the minimal energy you can expect. And then I will focus on the proof strategy by uh, Mainini, Piovano, and Stefanelli, and I will try to tell you what are the, the most important ingredients of the proof. And then at the end of my talk, I will um, explain you our approach. So the setup for the rest of the talk will be this one. We have seen this slide already. Just let me highlight two things. So again, we have this um, energy featuring two terms, a free body potential, which uh, minimizes angles which are multiples of pi over 2. And here is the pair potential. And for me, it's important to restrict now the pair potential in such a way that there is only an interaction if the distance of points is less than square root of 2, because I want to have in the square lattice interactions along the coordinate directions, but I don't want to have an interaction along the diagonal. And for simplicity in the following um, configurations, I will um, abbreviate, abbreviate them with a, a capital letter X. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do uh, with you is to discuss what's the mini minimal energy that you can expect. And first of all, to um, keep things simple, let's already assume that the configuration X is a subset of the lattice. Of course, at the end, that's what I want to prove, but let's first of all see what kind of energy you can expect. And in this case, for sure, the energy is minus 1 times the number of bonds that you have. Why so? Every bond gives you an energy minus 1 that's coming from the pair potential. And since all the angles are multiples of pi over 2, there is no contribution from, from the angular potential. OK, and then you see you can split this into two terms, which are called a bulk and a surface term. And this um, bulk term is an energy per particle times the number of particles n. And the other guy here is a surface correction. So how come? So if you look to the interior, each point in the interior has four neighbors. And this gives me a four. But each um, bond is associated to two atoms, so I have to divide four by two. And this gives me an energy minus two per particle. And then I have to observe that for particles at, at the boundary of the configuration, I'm somewhat missing bonds at at the, at the boundary, so I get kind of get a surface correction. 
So it seems it's more about the surface. So let me introduce a renormalized surface energy by taking my original energy and by subtracting the bulk term. So the bulk term was minus 2n. I subtract that, I get plus 2n. And then for some reason, I also multiply that with 2. That's convenient because now this quantity exactly gives me the number of missing surface bonds. And you see that minimizing the energy is equivalent to minimizing this object here. And this is nothing else than an isoparametric problem. I'm trying to minimize an, 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 a perimeter in this discrete set. And this should be the solution of this isoparametric problem. In the following, I want to show why you why this is the correct number. The upper bound will be done by a direct construction and the lower bound will be an isoparametric inequality. So let's start with the upper bound. Let me start with some number of atoms. I took 25, which are arranged in a square. And the corresponding surface energy is 20. And this comes from the fact that I have 20 missing surface bonds. Five on top, five on the bottom, five left, five right. And now I'm increasing the number of atoms and I can just put one somewhere and I'm producing a new line. And this um, increases my surface energy by two because I have new missing surface bonds here on the top and one on the bottom. So two additional missing surface bonds. And then I can increase the number of atoms and I don't change the surface energy. I sur change the surface energy, energy only at that point when I um, have an additional line, which gives me an additional two in the energy because I have a missing surface bond on the left and one on the right. And then I can conclude here uh, the rectangle or the, the square and I don't pay additional surface energy for that. Now, you kind of need to believe me that this number here, 20, 22, 24, really coincides with the seal function here. I just tell you, uh, so you have to believe me, but I just tell you that the point where you add a new line, where you change the energy, is exactly the point where the seal function jumps. So you can check that. Okay, um, a little bit more and interesting to me is the lower bound. So how do you prove the lower bound? And I suggest the following strategy. I take any configuration now, so that's an ansatz-free lower bound, and I'm taking the longest chain in the horizontal direction, it's here in red, and I take the longest chain in the vertical direction, it's in blue, and I call P1 and P2 the length of these chains. Actually, what I do, I take the projections onto the first and second coordinate direction, but that's not important, so um, it's uh, the same in the picture that you see. And then I claim that the renormalized surface energy is at least 2 pi 1 plus 2 pi 2. And the reason for that is the following. So whenever you have a red atom here and you go up, at some point you encounter a missing surface bond. And if you go down, you also encounter a missing surface bond. So each atom gives you a 2. And the same thing also happens for the blue chain. Okay, and at the same time, I know that all the atoms are contained in the container with length P1 and height P2. So the product of P1 and P2 is at least N. And now I'm gluing these things together in order to get rid of P P2. And I have a simple optimization problem in P1. This uh, is um, bounded from below by four square root of N. I sneak in the, the seal function because I need it. This gives me a minus two here, but you observe that all the quantities here are even numbers. So the strict inequality tells you already that this inequality holds. Okay, I'm a little bit fast here because that's not the important point. The important point that I want to make is that um, the idea is that you take a long horizontal and vertical chain and you kind of solve a, a simple minimization problem in order to get the correct lower bound for the energy. Now, this is what you do if you have subsets of the lattice, but remember, my actual goal is to prove crystallization, so I should um, look at any configuration. And now the strategy for any configuration is basically the same. You still try to show the lower bound for the energy. You can do it for the renormalized one or for the original one, that's not important. And you also want to prove at the same time, um, you want to characterize the equality case. Namely, you want to show that equality here can only hold if all the bond lengths are one and all the angles are multiples of pi over two. Because in this case, this together with connectedness of the configuration will tell you already that the configuration needs to be a subset of the square lattice. So what I want to tell you here is that um, proving the crystallization results in, is very much about the energy. So you need to prove a lower bound for the energy and you need to characterize the equality case and then you are done. 
Um, that's the reason why in the following, uh, I will very much um, concentrate on the discussion on the, on the energy. Okay, that's, that's what I said already. And um, now um, I will split my talk into uh, two, two steps. The first one will be the review of the result by Ulisse Stefanelli and collaborators. And then I will come to, to our approach. Now, um, so when we talk about their proof, the first thing we, we should do, we should um, talk about how they count the energy, because it's a little bit different from the argument I showed you before. And to make it simple again, let me first of all tell you what's the argument if you are a subset of the lattice, because this makes it a little bit simpler to understand what the, the strategy is. And uh, the strategy that they use is a strategy of um, removing so-called bond graph layers. And the idea goes as follows. So you start with uh, any configuration in the lattice, and maybe you have um, what they call a flag. You don't like it so much, so the first thing you do, you get rid of the flag. And this gives you a new configuration. I call it X prime. It's a smaller configuration because you remove one atom. And at the same time, you have to take care of the fact that you also change the energy. Because I removed one bond, I changed the energy by one. So I have to take care of this. OK, that's a preliminary step. And now comes, comes the main idea. Namely, they remove a boundary. They remove the boundary here. And they get a smaller configuration. And the smaller configuration is, is called x prime prime. And now we need to take care of the change in, in the energy. And let me call D the number of, of boundary atoms, so the number of atoms that are removed by this procedure. So how many bonds do I remove? So what's the change in the energy? So for sure, at the boundary, I had D atoms, so I also have D bonds. I remove D bonds. But now I also have bonds which come from the boundary to the interior. And you see that almost every atom has a bond also in the interior, but four atoms at the corners. So these four atoms at the corners, they don't have a bond to the interior. So by this procedure, I only remove D minus four bonds. So in total, I remove D bonds in the outer layer and then D minus four bonds into the interior. And another thing that you can observe is that now you have a smaller configuration. I called it X prime prime. And this um, smaller configuration also has a boundary. And now the number of um, atoms at the boundary is less. It's the original number of boundary atoms D minus eight. That's you can count. And now you kind of iterate this, this procedure and you um, iteratively remove the boundary and you see what you get. And let me, for this um, explanation, call Xi the configuration that you get if you remove the boundary A ti I times. And then di is for me the number of boundary at atoms that you have in the step i. And what we've seen on the previous slide is that there is a connection be the, between d in the step i plus one and d in step i, namely they change by eight. Okay. And now you can um, get the number of all atoms by summing up the, the d's, because that's what you remove in each step. And then you can calculate a little bit, and what you see is you get a relation between n and the number of iterations. So a capital I for me is the number of iterations that I have to do in order to remove everything. And the number is not important for the moment, just I can calculate that. I get a lower bound for this number of iterations. That's the one ingredient. And the other ingredient is that I can count the energy by um, the energy change in each, each step. And remember that in each step, the change of energy was related to um, the number of boundary points, and it was 2d minus 4. And um, now you can sum that up, and you see that summing up the d's will exactly give you the bulk term. And this minus 4 here, together with the number of iterations, gives you exactly the right um, surface contribution. OK. so. Um, the details on this slide are not so important. I just wanted to make the point that for me, um, it's a little bit more complicated to, to calculate the energy like this, in particular because you have to take care of, of two things. Namely, first of all, this minus four is very important here so in order to get the right surface contribution. And this was related, uh, as we have seen on the previous slide, to the fact that for the corner atoms, you, you um, see less bonds into the interior. Exactly, you see no bonds into the interior. So that's very important that you count that correctly in that argument. And the second in, 
um, contribution to the argument was this, this here, that you need a good relation between the number of atoms at the boundary of the configuration and the total number. So that are two ingredients for this, this argument. And um, compared to that, um, the argument that I was showing you before was a little bit simpler to me, where I just took the vertical and horizontal line and I solved this minimization problem. So that's how you count the energy differently by bond graph layers, and it gives you the same, the same energy. Now, the point is, what do you do now for general configurations? That's what they wanted to prove. They wanted to prove a crystallization result. And now, it's not the nice situation that everything is subset of a lattice, but um, you could have now chains of atoms which a little bit change their direction. They could, a little, could be a little bit curved, and uh, still what you can prove for energetic reasons is that all these angles here, they will be close to pi, but they will not be exactly pi, pi, pi maybe. So that means that you can curve a little bit along the chain. And if you have this in mind, you, you see kind of that this here, what we call the stadium, might be a problematic case for crystallization. So, and why is it problematic? Because if you look to the outer layer here, so I have this chain of atoms at the outer layer, where I have no corner. I have no corner, so if I do now the trick of removing the boundary, I see that I remove 2D um, bonds, and I'm missing the plus four. And I told you before that this, um, seeing this plus four was very important in order to get the energy right. So this is dangerous for you to remove more bonds in this procedure. Now, maybe you see, you, see, you tell me that this is not a good counterexample. So this is probably not a counterexample to crystallization because at the same time, I'm producing a lot of defects here. So here you see a lot of atoms which have uh, missing surface bonds which contribute to the surface energy. So probably this is not a counterexample. But still, this tells you that you kind of need to take care of this in the proof of this, this phenomenon. And the way um, they uh, take care of this um, is, is, the, is the following idea. Um, they take this outer chain and um, they call theta j um, the interior angle of this polygon. And they sum up all these angles, or better to say, they sum up the deviation from pi. And then um, this sum will give you minus 2 pi. The reason for that being, if you want, is just counting the, um, the, the angle sum in a polygon. Or if you want to phrase it in a more sophisticated way, it's a discrete version of gauss bonnet And then, um, let's look to the angular potential and to its contribution. Remember, all the bond angles are close to pi. They're maybe not pi, but close to pi. And I assumed a linear growth of my potential out of pi. So I can um, estimate that from below by the deviation from pi. And now this is a fixed sum. It gives me plus 2 pi, at least. And tuning this constant, I can tune this constant so big such that it's bigger than 4. And so now you see... On the top, I got a wrong estimate because um, I'm missing the four in the counting of the bonds, but I can compensate that, that my angular contribution is at least four, and this will give me together, so the bonds together with the angular contribution will give me the right boundary estimate where I'm fixing the missing four by this argument here. And here you also see, because I was um, um, emphasizing the point that you need a linear growth, you see that exactly at that point, if you had a quadratic growth, the argument would completely fail. Okay, now let's um, take this boundary energy estimate and let's put things together by an induction method. So um, I take my configuration, I remove the boundary, I call D the number of boundary atoms as we did it before. And the first inequality is exactly what I explained to you on the previous slide. I remove the boundary, I have this boundary energy estimate. Now, for the smaller configuration, I use the induction assumption, namely, I already know the minimal energy for that. It's, it's given in blue. And the only thing that you have to, um, to realize here is it's a smaller configuration. It has less atoms, namely exactly n minus d atoms. And then you glue the things together, and you see that you're already almost there. The only thing missing is that you have n minus d here that you don't know. And I told you before that the second ingredient in their calculation is they need to understand the relation between all atoms and the atoms at the boundary, so relation of n and d. And the way they take care of this is um, the Euler formula for planar graphs. So let me try to explain you very briefly this argument. 
And for simplicity, let me um, assume that the energy is minus the bonds. So I have always the inequality, but essentially for subsets of the square lattice, minus the bonds is the energy. So let's think of uh, energy and bonds as the same thing. And then they bring in the faces into the business. Namely, uh, I have squares in my configuration. And if I sum up all the faces, I take it times four. That should count me all the edges. But actually, it, it counts me all the edges in the interior twice and at the boundary once. So that gives you a relation between the faces and the bonds. And now you use Euler's formula. And you calculate a little bit. And you see you can get an expression for n minus d just in terms of the number of points and the bonds. But the bonds was minus the energy. So you can, again, replace b by minus the energy. And you plug it in here. So you replaced n minus d by this one here. And then if you're brave enough, you can calculate that you actually get the right energy. OK. So I was um, on purpose kind of too fast here, because it's not important that you kind of get the details. I want to just tell you that the ingredient to, to estimate this one is you need a topological invariant for planar graphs, namely Euler's formula. And this, like by a miracle, turns out to be the right thing to do. But um, in some sense, it's really restricted, it seems, for us that you can just use that in, in, in dimension two. So, and we don't know how to extend that in, in the three-dimensional three dimensional setting. OK, so this is the argument that I wanted to show you on the um, result by Ulysses Stefanelli. And now, based on this, let me uh, tell you what was our idea. So our idea was that we wanted to use the energy counting that I showed you at the beginning of my talk. And let me recall what this energy counting was. So the idea was based on taking a horizontal chain and a vertical chain, red and blue, um, and collecting the lengths of them, P1 and P2, and then doing this, this simple minimization problem, which I called an, an, an azoparametric um, inequality. Now let's see if I can still do it for general configurations. And um, let's take the stadium uh, again as a a possible competitor. OK, so the point here was before, let me remember, uh, recall that whenever I had a red atom and I went up or down, at some point I encountered a missing surface response. Let's try to do the same thing for the stadium. So here, if I go up, I don't see a missing surface um, bond, but I change my direction. And for, uh, for unfortunately, I go back to the blue chain. And the same thing for the blue chain. If I start there, I don't see a missing surface bond, but I go back to the other chain. So in this sense, this, this argument doesn't work anymore. And um, it seems that it's not working, but then we kind of had a dream. And the dream, um, I try to show it here, it's barely visible. I just removed some bonds now from the bond graph. And I um, highlight them. So here in, in, in thick red, you see the bonds that I now remove. And we claim that once you remove them, everything is fine again. Because now if I start here and I go this chain up, and these chains in the following we call uh, strata, so because they are going straight into one direction, uh, almost one direction, then you see that at some point you encounter a missing surface bond. And also if you go down, at some point you encounter a missing surface bond. So kind of the argument that I explained to you at the beginning, again, seems to work. Because I didn't really use the fact that I'm on a square lattice. The only thing that I really used is that whenever I go in a direction along a stratum, at some point, I encounter a missing surface bond. OK, so this is, of course, nice if you have the situation like this. But um, why can you assume it? Why can you just um, delete some of the bonds from your bond graph? And that's now our main um, method, what we call stratification of the bond graph. And the dilemma goes as follows. Um, so let me try to explain it to you. I start with the configuration x, and I associate the bond graph to it. x is, again, the, 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 the atoms, and e is the edges, so the bonds. And now I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I want to delete bonds as I do it here. And this corresponds to the fact that I take a new set of, of edges, a E prime, which is a subset of the original edges. And I have an energy estimate for that, which I will explain in a minute. But the important thing is now that all the strata, all the chains of, of atoms now have a small angle excess. And they don't really change their orientation. So to explain what I mean by that, let me rather go to the proof. 
And the proof goes as follows. It goes iteratively and it, it takes a chain of atoms, a stratum in the bond graph, and it asks itself, is this chain going in one direction or is it at some point changing its direction? And let's assume that it was changing its direction more than pi over six as an angle. And I collect as um, theta j the, in the angles in the chain, namely this one, which are almost uh, pi. And I um, collect the deviation from, from pi. And now I'm, I'm assuming that this is too big. And um, this exactly means that the orientation of my stratum changes. Okay. And then I go back to the, to the angle contribution of the energy and I do a similar trick as um, by Stefanelli and collaborators. Namely, I have this linear lower bounds um, when I deviate from pi. And um, this is now bigger or equal than pi over six. And I tune this constant in order to get something which is bigger than one. And this now allows me to remove one edge from the bond graph. Removing one edge from the bond graph is actually not a good idea from an energetic point of view because removing one bond costs me energy one. But at the same time, I compensate that by gaining energy of this angular contribution. And this gives me this energy estimate that for the new configuration, I still can um, control the, the energy which is just in the bonds by um, the original energy and, and, and the en entire energy which does not only see the bonds but also the angular um, contribution and I can compensate that. So I can compensate deleting of one bond by the contribution of the angles, which is very similar to the argument that we have seen before. Okay, you can do that on the level of the original energy. You can do that also on the level of the renormalized energy, of course. And now what's the interesting thing is um, that actually the renormalized surface energy, you can express it in terms of, of the strata. So remember for me, a strata was an almost straight um, chain of atoms in the bond graph. And now I'm claiming that the renormalized surface energy is nothing else than two times as a strata. And the reason for that is that whenever I have such a stratum, it's somewhere, it, somewhere it needs to begin, it's somewhere it needs to end. And where it begins, I see a missing surface bond, and where it ends, it's, I see the missing surface bond. So I here have a very simple expression now for the energy. I just need to count the number of strata, and I have to multiply it by two. And another interesting fact is that each point is exactly contained in two strata, one which is horizontal and one is vert what, which is vertical. So if I sum up all the length of strata, I get exactly 2n, two times the number of atoms, because each is contained in two. Now you might say maybe, okay, that's a stupid thing. So how can I speak of being orthogonal when I'm not a subset of set two? But what I said before is that all the angles, they are kind of almost multiples of pi over two. That means at least locally, I can make sense of being orthogonal to each other. Okay, and now based on this, let me try to conclude the argument. So um, we start with any configuration and its corresponding bond graph. Now we do the stratification. So we use this lemma in order to remove some of the edges. We get a new bond graph. We have a good control on the energy. And now I just need to find a lower bound for this new configuration. And actually what I need to prove, um, it suffices to prove to get a lower bound on the number of strata in exactly this sense, because then I get my desired lower bound on the renormalized surface energy. That's what's hidden here. So if I can bound this one, I immediately get also a lower bound for the renormalized surface energy. So in this sense, I remove, I reduce the problem to counting the number of strata, and I need to find a lower bound on the, on the number of strata, exactly as I did it in the square letter. And now my strategy is I take a long horizontal chain in red, I take a long horizontal chain, uh, sorry, vertical chain in blue, and I kind of hope that the product of the two lengths is big enough. Okay, let's assume that for the moment. And then I claim that the argument is exactly working as at the beginning of my talk because uh, nothing has changed. I'm just counting a number of missing surface bonds. I don't really use that I'm subset of the lattice. Okay, so I can redo the argument from the beginning. Once I have this, so this is of course very important. You need to choose the chains in such a way that their length is big enough. And I don't give you the complete proof of that. I just try to convince you why something like this can be true. And uh, the argument is as follows. So there are two cases. 
The first case is the num that the number of strata is already big. If the number of strata is already bigger than this one, I'm done because I'm not interested in anything else than the lower bound for the number of strata. So I can assume that the number of strata is not too big. But if the number is not too big and I have um, an information on the sum of the length, there needs to be at least one which is long enough and that's, one, that's the one that I choose. And based on that, you can actually prove that the two is true. So that's kind of um, the core of the argument. Okay, uh, so let me summarize briefly um, what I um, did today. So um, the idea of my talk was to revisit um, crystallization results in the plane for um, finite particle systems. And we looked to interaction energies featuring two body terms and three body terms, where the three body terms were favoring cubic arrangements so that you could expect to find um, crystallization in the square lattice. I um, have shown you um, previous um, um, results on crystallization and their proof strategies, which were um, relying on an induction method by removing um, boundaries and boundaries from, from the bond graph. And another ingredient of the proof there was, was Euler's formula for planar graphs. Instead, we were trying to, to boil down the, 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 the necessity of, of ingredients to a, to a minimum, and um, um, our um, approach was um, based on deleting some of the bonds from the bond graph and then basically using an edge isoparametric inequality. Okay, um, another thing that you can do that with that, I don't explain that today, but I'm happy to talk about that, uh, for instance, in the coffee break, you can also prove an N to the three four law um, in, in, this, in this framework or with this technique, which tells you something about the minimizers. So I didn't say that minimizers are unique or non-unique and they are highly non-unique and they kind of can fluctuate around the continuum and wolf shape. And this is what is known as the N to the three four law. Now, a final comment. So um, the question maybe that I didn't answer yet is why do I do that? So I'm, I, anything, everything that I did was just reproving results which have been known. And our idea was to have a different proof strategy because we have different um, new applications in mind. And um, two applications that I want to mention is first of all, um, we are trying to, to tackle the, the 3D case so in the cubic lattice um, together with Leonard. And, uh, for that reason, we were thinking that um, not needing boundary energy estimate is a first important step. And the other applications is, is bicrystals. So in bicrystals, you have um, not just one crystal, but you have two crystals which are attached to each other and it interact with each other. Um, this is what I do with uh, some of my uh, Vienna colleagues, with uh, Ulisse Stefanelli and with Wojtek Goni, uh, who's at the back. And uh, there, the point is that it seems like that you cannot use the induction method, so we wanted to, to have something which goes in a little bit uh, different direction. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>